Okay, so as Daisy said, my book, The Double X Economy, is first and foremost a call to action. I am literally trying to recruit people to join a worldwide movement to empower women economically. We are an extremely practical group and we are evidence-based, so this is not a movement for people who just want to wring their hands over the predicament that women are in. This movement is for women and men who want to actively make change. The book even ends with a chapter titled Next Steps. Double X economy is a term I coined to describe the global women's economy, not just women as workers, but also as business owners, investors, donors, consumers, and so on. The double X economy is huge. It produces about 40% of global GDP and 50% of the world's food supply. But despite its massive size, the special situation of the double X economy is consistently ignored by both economists and governments, as we can see happening right now in the face of a deadly pandemic. Large international data sets show clearly that the double X economy suffers from a distinctive pattern of inequality in every nation on the planet. Everywhere, this pattern is caused by the same set of constraints in place for hundreds, even thousands of years. So women's economic disadvantages are not the result of their inadequacies or their poor choices, as economists often claim, but of a long history of exclusion that spans the whole world. Let me show you an illustration. Daisy, could we have the first slide, please? These little dots represent the percentage of land held by women and men in each of 106 countries. The red dots are the women and the black dots are the men. It's pretty dramatic, isn't it? There are a few outliers, but the big picture is that men own more than 80% of the Earth's land. As a global average, women own about 18%. In Britain today, women own only 14% of the land. In the UK, as well as elsewhere, women are still disadvantaged from this long history in which land was passed only from male to male. I call it the Downton Abbey principle. Since land has been the main source of, source of wealth in world history, you can see how this inequality eventually sort of rolled up into a corner on capital. And that also has knock-on effects even today. For instance, women-owned businesses in Britain get only 9% of the available investment capital each year. Since before it was written, British common law included the principle of coverture, which denied women control over major assets and earnings, as well as taking away their own legal identity. This principle was spread around the world uh, during the colonial period, but it was also present in other countries. So it was spread all over the world by those colonial powers as well. But the truth is, that other places have the same rule because the rule itself is so old. The historical evidence shows that the rule that women can't are property and can't own property has been in place a long time. In fact, you can find it in Hammurabi's code. This slide can go away now. I began my involvement with women's economic empowerment during research in the rural areas of the poorest nations. I found a disturbing phenomenon wherever I went. I was focused on efforts to keep girls in school through the secondary level, which is something that is known to build national economies and reduce poverty. And try, trying to help girls in various ways, we learned what was really going on in those communities. I saw that by far the biggest barrier was that girls were seen as property for fathers to exchange in marriage in return getting money and other items of value. The fathers did not want to wait for the girls to finish school before they got their money, so as soon as the girls menstruated, she was gone. Communities thought females had no other economic value or no options, particularly because they could not inherit land. So there was a strong preference for sons everywhere. They wanted to keep the sons close by and they cultivated them and preferred them. But they, these same families were fine to let the girls go, usually far away if the price was right. As I continued to research these questions, I found that the history of gender inequality began with hunter-gatherer men trading women 
and the practice is thought by anthropologists and evolutionary theorists to have been universal. These same men also fed women less to the degree that they often cause stunting and malnutrition, something we can even see in, in the teeth and bones that were left behind. And we still see the starving and the trading all over the world, even today. Men have controlled economic resources, including food, since the beginning of time. They have not been particularly good providers. Next slide, please. Here's an example of how this um, holding back of resources hits the ground today. This is a graph that shows you uh, 132 countries um, measurement for wage equality for similar work, which is a measurement taken annually by the World Economic Forum. It's a measure that can't be manipulated in the same way that other data is sometimes manipulated on equal pay. Um, a practice that I find horrifying because it is absolutely dishonest. Um, but this one, this one's clean. So what you see here, uh, the blue arrow shows uh, the bar at 100. That black bar uh, marks where women would have to be in order to be equal with men. And each of the red columns shows what a country ranked on that wage equality for similar work. You can easily see that there is not a single country in the world where women are paid equal to men, even when doing the same jobs. This is a measure that basically gets at what is customary to pay women, what is implicitly fair to pay women. And you can see that there is basically a global rule of thumb that says women are only worth about 65% of what men are worth. And this is just one more symptom of women's disadvantages, but it happens across the whole economy. Consider, for instance, that 99% of international trade is controlled by men, and 99% of large sales contracts go to men. It is thorough dominance, what we might in another situation call a monopoly. So this book that I've written has broad scope but it does come down to earth too. There is even a chapter on UK equal pay, uh, which um, is actually a topic I can really get steamed about, as well as access to capital for women business owners in the United Kingdom. Also something I can steam about pretty well. Okay, so uh, let's take a look though at um, another graph. Can, you, can we see it please, Daisy? What I want to do here is to show you the potential for what would happen if we list, lifted the constraints on the double X economy. The vertical axis here is GDP per capita, and the horizontal axis is the economist's um, index of women's economic opportunity. This pattern of little red dots going up and to the right is the after picture of a, an economy, whether they are ready to grow or not. That is, we see here what happens to an economy when it does a better job of including women. And it's visible to the naked eye that countries who treat their women better are more prosperous. Now, initially when this kind of data came out, people dismissed it by saying, well, you know, the national, uh, the uh, rich nations can afford to let their women go free. But over time, other evidence has come together to show us that actually the result, uh, the, the real truth is exactly the opposite. It's not that the rich nations could afford to let their women go free. It was sending their women free that made them rich. And this is how sending women free leads to prosperity as well as reduced, reducing tragic suffering and extreme costs of things like human trafficking, hunger, and domestic violence. Now let's ask a question that I think is, is pretty obvious at this point. Is there something natural about this? So I did research on that too. Um, and I've detailed that as well as the history I just gave in the book. The short version is that we continually pro uh, compare ourselves to chimpanzees because we have thought that they were the closest cousin that we have genetically. And chimp males are dominant, and in fact, they are quite competitive with each other and warlike. 
But we now know that there is another species that we are equally close to, and that is even uh, almost genetically identical to chimpanzees, and that's called bonobos. And bonobos are female dominant. And chimps have a culture of domination, but the female dominant bonobos have a culture of sharing. We have considerable evidence at this point that the dominance of men is toxic. It causes horrible tragedies, war, like I said, hunger and human, human trafficking. Male dominance is emphatically not adaptive. Now the problem is we don't know uh, which what the common ancestors between these three species, including humans, um, was. We don't know about that. But the most recent science sees these things evolving in tandem. In other words, genetics with behavior, with social factors, and with um, hormonal levels even. And so it's entirely possible that this is something that has developed over time. But it is universal. And that makes people think it can't be changed. But war and disease are also universal, and we don't just let them go unchecked. And we should not do the same with patriarchy because it hurts a lot of people, including men. But can we change it? And the answer to that is yes, we absolutely can. Humans are highly malleable, even at this level. And the women's economic empowerment is attacking inequality at what I think is its root the economic exclusion of women. Already we have discovered lots of practical ways to dissolve some of these problems. There are large world organizations involved, but we still need your help. World leaders still tend to ignore the double X economy, and actually we're finding out in the pandemic more local leaders do as well, uh, despite its size and potential. Um, and so, it's something that needs to have public attention and that will benefit if people use simply any means available to them to get involved. And that means social media, anything you can think of. And like I said, I've given some examples uh, in the book uh, that will give somebody some, some answers or suggestions. So here I am entreating you to join this movement in any way available to you. I can promise that it will be worth every minute we can spare, every tool we can invent, every tweet we can send out, and all the funds that we have to invest to set the double X economy free.